Well, good morning. It's always a, a joy to, to get to be back with uh, my people. Right? If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me this morning to John chapter 20. And we'll be looking at verses 1 through 18 in John chapter 20. We, uh, as people have uh, a certain uh, thing that we do. Uh, no matter who we are we, or, or where we are in life, we're always trying to do and be something else or someplace else. Uh, we, we live in a constant state of seeking to recreate ourselves, uh, wh- whether that be through, you know... Um, I, I am going, this year, I'm going to, to go through, like, this weight loss challenge. We, yeah, we all snicker at that one. Um, you know, or, or this year, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to, to recreate my aesthetic. I love that one. Uh, or, you know, this year, I'm going to, to improve myself uh, by, by learning uh, a new skill, a new trade, a new hobby that's going to turn into a side hustle that's going to make me rich and all my problems will go away. <laughs> but but we, uh, all that to say, we live in this constant state of seeking to recreate ourselves because of one fact and one reason. We know that there's something wrong with us. Where we come now in John's gospel, here in chapter 20, John will answer all of our problems to say, you're right in assuming you have something wrong with you. That much is true. But you're going about it in the completely the wrong way. You're seeking to recreate yourself, but what the resurrection of Christ displays is that we must not recreate ourselves, but we must trust the fact that Jesus is making all things new. And in this passage, we're going to see four ways that Jesus is making all things new. Uh, Before we come to the text, let us ask for the Holy Spirit's help in prayer. Oh, gracious Lord, we come to you now rejoicing in Christ our King who's conquered sin and death and the grave and is transforming His people and making us more and more into His image. And so now, O Lord, as we come to His Word, may we have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to know His Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from John, chapter 20, starting with verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooped down to look in. He saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. 
But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had laid, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. Well, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. So what John wants us to see this morning is that Jesus is making all things new. And he shows us this in four different ways. The first way uh, we actually see in verse 1. Jesus is making all things new by being the light of of a new era. Jesus is making all things new by being the light of a new era. We see this in verse 1. It opens this way. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Uh, the Greek here is, uh, is a little bit more descriptive, and it has sort of this uh, phrase that goes with it. It's actually probably a little bit closer to this. On the first of the Sabbaths. It, it's, it's seeking to hearken us back to the creation itself. It, it's calling forth to say, do you remember in Genesis 1 where God created everything? He spoke and things came into existence. And, and on the first day, he, he speaks and there's light. And he goes through the, the rest of, of the week, and then on the seventh day, he rests. But, but all of this, the, the creation narrative itself, is anticipating a new era, a final rest, a, a, a cosmic gathering together and being joined with the Lord. It's calling for us to cast our eyes forward and anticipate this coming great Sabbath, a new day, as it were. And, you know, and I think it's really, really interesting that, that so much of the time, typically we think that our big issue is actually uh, the era in which we live. We, we get, like, painfully nostalgic one way or another, and so, like, you know, we, we look back and we say, I was born in the wrong... Uh-oh. But, okay, it's fine. We're good. Uh, so we live in this, in this you know, painful strain uh, of, uh, of seeking to, to think that if we just lived in a different era, then all of our problems would go away, right? For some people, it's like the golden age. It was the 50s. It's tremendous, right? If we just lived in the 50s, everything would be fine. Um, you know, what's really interesting now, I'm a teacher, and, and so I'm, I spend all my time around, way too much time, around high schoolers. And, and the, the era that they're like, there were no problems back then, is the 80s and 90s. Do you feel old yet? Yeah. You know, like, and, you, and you show up to school or like, you know, heaven forbid, like you go to the mall, right? Because I'm a royal sucker for, for Yankee Candle. I mean, my wife is a royal sucker for Yankee Candle. <laughs> And, and so you're walking through, you know, the mall because, you know, 
My wife likes our house to smell good. And, and, and we're sitting there, and I'm like looking at all of these 15-year-olds and thinking, you know, did I like accidentally stumble onto, you know, uh, the, the set for Saved by the Bell? What's happening here? Like we've got <laughs> Mario Lopez actually in Franklin. And so, um, it, you know, and so you're there, and like, but there's this idea of, of things worked then, whether that be a bygone era, or sometimes we think, you know, uh, because of the progress, that we're heading in a good direction, that if we just keep going, things are going to work themselves out, and the era that is coming will be better. But it'll be better by our own means. And it was better back then uh, because of the things that we were doing back then that we're not doing now. Or in the future, it'll be better because the things that we're, we're progressing towards, we are going to recreate this thing. But what John is highlighting here is that actually an entirely new era has begun. Jesus Christ, by rising from the dead, has started a new thing. He is, John, uh, Paul will say, he is the first fruits of the resurrection. Death no longer has dominion. The grave has been conquered and a new day has begun. From the darkness brought forth light. And here he stands saying, you belong in a different era. The era where the king rules and reigns. Not sin and death but a living, resurrected Lord. But not only a, a new day, uh, G, that's not all that Jesus is doing and making new, it's actually also a new kingdom, which is the second way, actually, that, that Jesus is making all things new. He, he's making all things new by transforming the looks of the kingdom. And we see this in verses 1 through 8. And notice, like, I won't read the whole passage, but, but as you kind of go down through the, the section here, you, you have Mary and John and Peter, and they keep showing up to the grave and going, it, it's empty. Right? And they're stating that, like the painfully obvious here. They, they show up, it, it's empty. It, and their assumptions are, are, it seems to be at least typically different, right? So, so Mary shows up, it's still dark, the, the stone's rolled away, she sees it and they go, somebody's taken Jesus. Yeah. Somebody has gone to the grave and they've taken Jesus. And then, then there's like the next thing that happens where Peter and John, they go running to the tomb and, and John pauses and he doesn't go in. Because he, he just sees the clothes. And many commentators look at that and say, he doesn't go in. Why? Because he assumes that there's a body still there. There's this thought in John's mind of, that is where death is. That's where the body of my Lord is. Um, and, and, you know, it's very interesting that, that constantly in just these little eight verses, there are three different Greek words used five different times all describing what they saw. And they saw an empty tomb. And they saw an empty tomb. And they saw an empty tomb. And so John is asking us to walk with them and to see what they saw, and yet at the end of it, they didn't get it. They see an empty tomb, but they have no clue why. And verse 9 explains why. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Here's what they were doing here. They were assuming that the kingdom would look a particular way, and it didn't. And so they're sitting here trying to process this thing. No, he, he is the Messiah. He is the king. He's the son of David. He, he's going to come and, and he's going to rain down fire. on the, Like he's going to chase the Romans out. And all is going to be well for us. And we're going to have a great time in Jerusalem. And it's going to be fantastic. And what is Jesus doing here? He's making 
a different kind of kingdom. A new kingdom that they have no way of computing whatsoever. They see it, but they don't see it. Um, my personal opinion. There is one decent Nicolas Cage movie. <laughs> Some people, the vast majority of people, would argue with me and say that's not true. There are no decent Nicolas Cage <laughs> movies. But I think there's one, uh, and that is National Treasure, because Nicolas Cage gets to play Nicolas Cage. Um, and in, in that movie in particular, there, there's one instance, right, because they're, if you haven't seen it, they're going on this like massive treasure hunt. And, and you know, they're, they're, you know, they have to steal the Declaration of Independence, and there's a secret treasure and all this stuff. Um, spoiler alert here. And, and, and what do they find out? They find out that on the back of the Declaration of Independence is a treasure map. The only issue is the treasure map is completely invisible. You cannot see it. And the only possible way that you can see this treasure map is to have these special glasses uh, invented by none other than Benjamin Franklin. And, and so, you know, here they are, they're like trying to explain to people, right, like, we, we need the Declaration of Independence because there's a treasure map on the back and there's like this, you know, massive treasure that, you know, like the Knights Templar and stuff found. And, and you know, they're like, I've seen the back of the, the Declaration of Independence a bazillion times. There's no treasure map. And they're like, yeah, it's because it's, it's invisible. And people are like these, they're like, these jokers are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, right? Like... <laughs> what do you mean? The, there it is. There's no treasure map. It's just a, an old piece of parchment, you know. Um, do it. And yet Jesus has spent his ministry doing a very similar thing of the kingdom of heaven is very different. You, you disciples belong to a kingdom that's not of this world. And they're like, yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. That's right. You're right, Jesus. We belong to a kingdom that beats the Romans. Woo! You know, and, and she's like, no, no, like, that's not what this kingdom's about. This kingdom is a kingdom that is not seen yet. It's a kingdom that, in fact, is not of this world. And there's a king that is ruling over this kingdom that doesn't look the way that most kings do. You think of king, you think of King David. Right? You're thinking the great warrior, the giant slayer, etc., etc. And what do we see? We see a lion of the tribe of Judah who's also the slain lamb. A, a king who's going to conquer by being conquered. A kingdom that's an upside down kingdom. A kingdom that doesn't take from people. A kingdom that gives. A kingdom for the broken, for the weak, not for the strong. One of the things I think is the issue in the church is so often we think of this kingdom in terms of kingdoms that we see. And Jesus has just made very, very clear in this section that this kingdom that he has preached and this kingdom that he is bringing is a kingdom that's nothing like this world. Mary and John and Peter, their eyes had not been opened by the work of the Spirit. And that's part of our issue, like sometimes. It is, it, our eyes haven't been opened to see the beauty of this kingdom. Our eyes all too often are, are fixated on the carnal, worldly means uh, of, of growing something. It, it, example. Um, so many in the church today think that God needs us and that God needs our money. And that God needs our, our platforms and our power 
and our flashiness and our ability to draw a crowd or be persuasive or market and brand well. And we think that God needs this because we're seeking a kingdom that's actually just like this world. But the kingdom that Jesus brings is the kingdom of a suffering servant. A kingdom who comes to the rebels and gives his life. And what does he ask in return? Your sin. Your wretchedness. Your uncleanness. Your filth. That's what he asks. He comes and he pays it all and he says, behold, the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the lowly. A vastly, vastly different kingdom. But uh, how is this kingdom, like what does it look like? How does it get here? Here's what we see. This kingdom is a kingdom particularly where death is undone. A kingdom where death is undone. This is in verses 11 through 15. So John uh, is a master at highlighting certain things and saying things without saying things. And, and so in this particular section, what he's actually doing is he's taking us right back to the very beginning, um, all the way back to Genesis 1, to show us that Jesus has actually undone the curse of the fall. In, in this section in particular, here's what John is doing. Watch this. He's painting parallel passages and giving us a tale of two gardens. The first garden in Genesis 1 and 2, was a perfect garden where death crept in. The other garden is not a perfect garden, but it's actually the garden where death is undone. Uh, In the first garden, one woman brought death in the grave. In the other one, a woman stands outside a tomb weeping because of death. In the first garden, it's guarded and kept and protected by two angels from keeping uh, Adam and Eve from coming in. In this garden, there are two angels sitting there welcoming them with open arms. Do you see what has just happened? The the overarching story, like if the Bible is, is really confusing to you, here is one way that you can think about it that will put the puzzle pieces together. Here's the storyline of Scripture. Uh, God creates all things. He makes it good. Adam and Eve fall in the garden. Uh, There's a curse of sin and death throughout the whole creation. The rest of the Bible is answering the question, how is God going to fix it? And here we stand in the middle of John 20, and the Lord is saying, this is how I fixed it. You wanted to know how I was going to bring you back to me, that you could dwell in my presence, that you could be welcomed back into the garden itself. Here's how. I'm going to send my son, and he's going to die on your behalf. I'm going to send the eternal son of God, and he's going to take your curse and your punishment, and that's how you're going to come back in. Jesus has undone the curse and brought us back. There's a a love that we have uh, specifically for movies where curses are undone. And those are great stories, right? Like, everybody loves Sleeping Beauty. Um, I don't know anybody who is not a fan of Beauty and the Beast. I don't care who you are. And I'm not a musical guy, but I am a fan. Um, The Lord of the Rings, right? We love talking around here. It's a great story. That's a great storyline. Why? Because that's our world. We live in a fallen and cursed world, and you don't have to convince anybody of that. Have a conversation with the starkest atheist in the world, and they'll be like, yeah, things are pretty messed up, right? 
You don't have to convince people that things don't operate the way they're supposed to operate. And we love these stories where the curse is undone because that's our deepest longing. The real question is, how are you seeking to undo the curse yourself? The real question for everybody is, how are you in one way, shape, or form trying to get back to the garden? Um, some people think that they'll get back to you know, the garden uh, through, through drugs. <laughs> some people think that they'll get back through to the garden and things will be perfect through, you know, if I just take enough meds, I'll be good. Uh, some people like have daily sessions with their therapists. Some people uh, think, you know, my political activism is how I'm going to get back to the garden. And we live in like this over-realized reality, longing for a garden, and this is universal. Everybody's longing for a garden, and everybody has a really terrible way of getting back, and the way that you're getting back to the garden, aside from Jesus, is your idol. There you found it. Some people are trying to get back to the garden, and they've been on such a long and difficult journey that at some point they finally just shut down. They just stop. You know, I can't get back to the garden, so what am I going to do? I'm just going to play video games for you know, 18 hours a day. Or I'm just going to keep uh, ESPN on you know, 24-7. I'm not going to worry about my kids. I'm not going to worry about my wife or my family or my job or anything like that. I'm shutting down. I'm turning it off. Maybe like this. Mic. I, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, it, oh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there you go. Perfect. That sounds way better anyway. So anyway, we, we're striving in so many different ways to try to get back to the garden. And that's our idolatry. But here Jesus stands outside of the tomb, and he said, I've already gotten you back. Like, like here you are, and I'm here, and I'm bringing you back to this place, not by the stuff that you're doing, but by what I've done. And, and it's interesting, you know, that, that here Mary Magdalene is, and, and she's, you know, been terrified and, and worried that Jesus is gone, and she has no idea what to do, and, and she's standing there, and Jesus just speaks a word. Mary. And she turns around, and she's like, that's him. The sheep hear my voice, and they know it. But what's really interesting, so, you know, throughout this fallen world, we belong to a different kingdom, this new creation that Jesus has brought and is restoring his people. But now then the question is how? Right? He, he's brought us back to the garden, true, and he's restoring us, yes, but how? This is the big one. Jesus is creating all things new by uniting us to God. Verse 17. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Do you know what makes death, death in Genesis 1 through 3? It's not the, the stopping of your body. What makes death, death is being separated from God. Right? Like, yeah, we, our assumption in this life is like, what is, is death in our culture? It's not getting to do what we want. But biblically speaking, what is death? It's not living as 
God has intended us to in relation with him. And yet here Jesus is saying to, to one, this woman of like the shadiest past possible, don't cling to me yet. Why? Because I haven't ascended to the Father. I, I haven't gone to that state where I'm sitting and ruling and reigning over all things. But here's what I want you to do. Go to my brothers. You know those guys who like a chapter earlier ran away and abandoned their brother? Like, I would punch my brothers if they abandoned me like that. Like, and I love my brothers, but I'm like, y'all are jerks. You left me. <laughs> and, and yet here he's, he's telling them, like, they've abandoned him, and he's known that they're going to do that. And what does he say? They're my brothers. And what am I doing now? I'm ascending to my father and your father. The Bible's been waiting the whole framework from Genesis 3 to here for somebody to say that God is your father. That's what the abundance of life looks like. The rebels from Genesis 3 onwards, the ones who curse God, who is righteous, no, not one, who seeks after God, nobody. And what has the Lord done? He's come and he's latched himself onto us. And he said, you know the father, how, how he is forever my father and I'm forever the son? Well, now you're mine. And because you're mine, now you're God's. And there is not a single thing you can do to undo that reality. These adoption papers here are final, and it's written in red. These kids are mine. And you've been bought with the highest of price. The prodigal has been brought home. The wretched has been cleaned. And we belong to Jesus now. Here is the answer to every question that you've probably ever had. Every difficulty in your life, here's the answer to it. You're not your own. You belong to somebody else. You weren't made to get ahead in life and get rich and be notable and well-known and well-liked and rich and famous and beautiful and all of that. You were made for a far greater purpose than that. You were made for God. Amen. And do you want evidence for that? Here it is. God sent his son to conquer the grave and the death that you would be his. So, if you belong to Christ, do what Mary Magdalene does. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced. That's a, a little bit like, you know, that's very tame. Uh, it's more like Mary went and proclaimed and shouted uh, it's this picture of the person who goes before the king to say, the king is coming, and he's bringing some good news. She went and proclaimed, yelled, shouted to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and here's what he told me. If you belong to Jesus, that's our call. Go and proclaim this good news. But if you don't belong to Jesus, pray that Jesus would open your eyes, that you would see a better kingdom than you could ever imagine, that you could see a resurrected Lord who has died for you, that the, the Lord himself would bring you in and that you would be a citizen of this kingdom that he is preaching and that you would see it in all of his glory and that you'd be united to God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Christ, 
our King and our risen Lord, who sits now on his throne bodily, united to humanity now and forevermore. We come to you eager to see your kingdom, to see your power, to see your glory. And so, Lord, don't leave us in this community in a place of death, but let us see newness of life. For you sent your son into the world to die, but to bring newness of life. And so now, O oh Lord, may we cast our eyes to him and come to his table and fellowship with him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.